Hi, good day, everyone. Welcome to our workshop on adding chat to a Flutter application with Sendbird. Uh, my name is Jason Ku. I am a developer advocate at Sendbird. Uh, if you can hear me okay, uh, if, if someone could just uh, type in the chat window that uh, you can indeed hear me, that would be great. That way I know I'm not uh, talking um, to a broken mic or a broken stream. Well, good. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. Awesome. Great. Okay. So what I will do is I will share my screen because I not, don't think I'm doing that at the moment. Oop. Uh, here we go. Okay. So uh, if you can't, oh, okay. I can see my screen up there. Good. Okay. Excellent. Okay. So again, we are uh, workshop today is we're going to talk about adding chat to a Flutter application using Sendbird. And before I really get started, there are two uh, prerequisites to following all along with us on the workshop today. One is having Flutter installed onto your developer, uh, the, your development machine. The easiest way to do that is to add an extension to Visual Studio Code if you're using that as your IDE. Otherwise, if you're using Android's, uh, Android Studio or IntelliJ's ID, IDE, you can go to their respective plugin marketplaces and download the Flutter plugin. You can also develop on Emacs, although I'm not entirely sure what the best way to install Flutter for Emacs is, other than possibly pulling down the CLI. So if you're using Emacs, uh, do check out Flutter's uh, own uh, own install page. The the other requirement that you will need is you will need a active Sendbird account to be able to test the the, the, the chat system. Uh, it's right now it's very easy. You can sign up for 30 days of free Sendbird use. In that 30 days, you can use all of the features associated with chat and including voice and video services. Okay, so there is time while I kind of talk about things at a high level to download both, uh, to download Flutter and to uh, sign up for Sendbird. So if, uh, if you'd like to, again, follow along, you can uh, do that at this, po at this point. Okay, so real quickly, what I'll be covering today is real briefly on Flutter. What is Flutter in case you haven't heard of what Flutter is, why you might use it why Sendbird is a good choice for real-time chat messaging. And then I'll briefly cover why you may want to use a third-party UI to render the chat service. And then I'll go to the, uh, uh, go to the demo portion where I'll code up uh, into a Flutter app all these components together. Uh, that, that's where I, I plan on spending the, the bulk of this workshop's time. And then I'll conclude with the Q&A. I do have the chat window open, so if you have any questions during, uh, I will try to answer it while I'm giving my uh, presentation component. Uh, but if I miss, definitely bring it back up uh, in the Q and A uh, section of this this workshop. Okay, so why Flutter? If you haven't heard of Flutter before, Flutter is one of the most recent cross-platform development frameworks uh, that has come out in the last couple of years. There, there's been a lot in the past, but uh, Flutter is exceptional in that. It not only allows you to create applications for both Android and iOS from a single code base, from that single code base, you can also deploy to web browsers. You can deploy to desktop apps, including Linux, Windows, and uh, Mac, of course. And uh, with the announcement uh, earlier this week, I think just yesterday, uh, with 2.2, they now have an alpha for UWP Windows uh, applications. Okay, so again, this is all from a single code base. Now, the one caveat of the single code base is, is that it is written in Dart, uh, which is not a language that probably most developers already have in their repertoire. But Dart syntactically is not too different from JavaScript, Swift, Kotlin. So any developer that already codes in one of those languages won't find it very difficult at all to shift over to Dart. Um, it's very, very similar. Okay, and the last thing that's really going for Flutter is its performance. Again, native development is going to be the fastest and most memory efficient, but Flutter is just marginally slower, right? It's very close to, uh, I guess, very close to the metal. Uh, this is in comparison to other cross-platform development systems, which have a considerable amount of overhead. In this chart, which probably looks a little small, that giant blue graph is actually React Native, and that's the, um, uh, I think that's it's the amount of time for it to run this particular test. And then right next to it is Flutter, and then Swift and Objective C, so you can see Flutter is right about uh, right on par with uh, the native uh, languages and framework. Okay, and the kind of last big bits of why you might want to 
developing Flutter is. It's open source. It's increasingly popular. In fact, according to Google yesterday, they said it's the most popular cross-platform development system out there. And it is backed by Google and it's been backed by Google for quite some time. Uh, and their engineers continue to really, um, really to add to, um, to Flutter's uh, capabilities. Okay, next, why Sendbird? If you didn't get a chance to um, listen to uh, Sid and Peyton talk about Sendbird in an earlier session uh, that occurred just before this workshop, then uh, real briefly, Sendbird has a really powerful backend service for providing real-time communications. And that same infrastructure powers three, three of our primary products. One is Sendbird Chat, which we will talk about in more detail later today. And our next product is Sendbird Calls, which provides voice and video services. So you can you know, talk one-on-one -on -one with people, you can do group calls, and you can even do screen sharing through uh, the service. The last product we have is Sendbird Desk, which is a kind of a full featured product wrapped around chat to provide a customer service uh, system for you and your customers. And uh, briefly, another great advantage of, our many great advantages of Sendbird is uh, we're very scalable. So we have seven data centers spread across the globe. So wherever you're located, your users can expect low latency and high performance. We have a reliable infrastructure and we're secure. We are SOC 2 compliant, HIPAA compliant, GDPR compliant, and ISO 27001 compliant. Uh, so we, we take security very, uh, very seriously and we're always looking to, to improve. Okay, and the last thing uh, that we're going to combine today in our demo is, again, Flutter, Sembert, and a third-party UI library. So you may be asking why use a third-party UI library? Well, for displaying chat, it's um, uh, actually a fairly complex orchestration of various UI components. We have you know, your typical chat bubbles, um, but not just bubbles, right? Like how much should you render the corners? How much spacing should you give to the text? Uh, how, how much does it adjust for different various types of text? Do you wanna add avatar images? Do you want to support video images, audio image files, and even just the text field and sending in text, right? All of these components added together can, we, can add up to quite a bit of development time if you're building it from the ground up um, to say run a prototype, an MVP, or even to start building a product on. It's going to be much faster if you use a existing framework or a plugin that already has all this completed and is extensible. Okay. All right, so now the fun part of the workshop is getting into code. Okay, so before I get started, just some general uh, architectural things. We are going for the most minimalistic example of uh, this type of integration. Right, so we're not going to have a full login screen. We're not going to have authentication and user management. We are building this under the assumption that uh, that this could be attached to an existing application. Let's say a marketplace app. So you have a buyer who's already come into your app. They've logged in. They've got a unique user ID, and they're looking at some product, and they're, they want to talk to the seller. The seller has a unique user ID already. So this system in place already where we have a user ID for the device user, the buyer and the seller, what we're going to do is just taking that information, show how you can connect the two using Sendbird and have a real-time chat. Okay. Okay. So what I'm going to do is, if you can see this, is go to my terminal. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new Flutter app from the ground up and call these API days. This will take just a few seconds to build a full Flutter project, um, which will be default. And what we'll do is we'll go into API days and we will open this with Visual Studio Code, which is my preferred IDE for doing Flutter projects, most projects actually. Okay, so we can see here we have a default Flutter project. Now the default Flutter project, uh, no, this is not a default Flutter project. Let's see, where did this go? Okay, too many windows, let me try this again. Uh, hmm, okay, I might accidentally be trying to 
open a pre-existing one. So what I will do is back out of here and I will create a new one. We'll call this uh, API Base India. This. And then I'll try this again to open Studio Code. But of course, I want to go into the directory. Apologies. It is India. Dash A. Studio Code. Folder. OK, now this looks like an empty project to me. OK, so the way a Flutter project, uh, this is kind of a typical setup. You have a lot of uh, kind of automatically generated folders, Android for Android deployments, iOS for iOS deployments. We have test folder, web for browsers. The folder that most people or you will typically edit in is in the lib folder. And in here, we have a single Dart class, the main. And we can spin this up actually. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on a simulator. Here we've got an iPhone 12 Pro Max, and then we will ask Flutter to grab its device ID by typing in Flutter device, oh, Flutter devices. We do want one device, but we want to search all devices. So what that command will do is it will look on your system and pull up all the simulators and any devices that are hooked up to uh, your development machine. Now to run an app, we just do run dash D for device and then put in the device ID. Now this is a long ID, uh, but fortunately the Flutter team doesn't require you to put all that in. You just have to put enough characters for the system to know, to differentiate between the different simulators or devices. In this case, the first character is enough. So this process uh, usually takes about a half minute. It'll take a while. So while this app is building for the first time, I'm going to go ahead and start stubbing out the one Dart file that we're going to add. So this is not the ideal way to not the ideal way to architect a production app, but this is a good way to cut down on the amount of time and to kind of showcase everything in one file. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just copy the material package. So Dart Flutter offers two general UI packages uh, out the gate. One is the Material Widgets Library, and the other is Cupertino. The Material Library contains the Material um, Design widgets that you would see typically in an Android application. Cupertino, uh, respectively, contains a lot of the UI widgets that look like native iOS components. Uh, here we'll just use material since that's default. Okay, so here we've got the default Flutter sample app that runs. This is just a counter of how many times you tap the button. Great, works wonderful, everything renders fine. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to gut the main.dart file since we're not going to use this app. So what we're going to do is we want to call this other screen, which will display the chat view, like what we uh, what I kind of showed earlier. So to do that, we are going to create a stateful class and this chat screen stateful widget or stateful widget. So stateful widget, uh, as it we can kind of imagine, is a type of widget that can have its state changed. And to make this happen, we have to put in a bit of boilerplate. We have to create a state object for it. And the state object typically follows the same naming pattern as the screen it is for. This extends a state, which is the state of the chat screen. And anytime you have a class in Flutter that has to render UI, you have to override the build <clears throat> the build function. And this takes one argument, the build context or the context of the UI. Here we're going to return an empty scaffold. So a scaffold in Flutter is basically what you see here on the right. It is a basic view with a navigation bar and then a kind of a body content. So the navigation bar is just called app bar. And we're just going to put in a little simple title. We'll put in an assembled demo here. 
and we'll put uh, just an empty container in the body since we will be replacing this part. Okay, so now, uh, oh, so I need to actually initialize the state. So writing the create state function. State. Okay, so this should be all we need to uh, to render in basically an empty screen. So what I'm going to do here is replace this home page with that new dash chat screen. To do that, I first have to import the dash chat screen. And I will just replace the home page with that. We're not going to have any other screens to navigate through, so we don't need to add routes. Okay. So one great thing about Flutter is you can do hot reloading, which uh, is much faster than kind of recompiling and rebuilding the entire app. So to do that, I just do Shift R, that restart. And here we have our wonderful empty container of an app. Okay, so now the fun part is actually putting in Dash Chat, the UI library, and powering it by Sendbird. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to the pubspec.yaml file. This is how Flutter handles dependencies, and we're going to add dependencies here. So uh, speed things along. I'll just copy and paste the current versions. So here we have Sendbird SDK and the Dash Chat dependencies. I'll just click Save. And because Visual Studio Code's Flutter extension um, kind of monitors the PubSpec YAML file, whenever you do an update here and just save, it will run Flutter pub get, which will pull down the appropriate dependencies or adjust dependency, dependencies if you've adjusted um, you know, different versions here. OK, once that is in, then we just add the headers. And these headers, or not the headers, the import statements, you can get by looking at pub.dev, which is the dependency, kind of the go-to dependency um, resource for uh, Flutter projects. So here, if I look up Sendbird, you want to look for the Sendbird SDK. This is the official uh, package. And go to the Installing tab. And here, you can see the dependency that needs to go into PubSpec YAML that we just did. And here is the import statement. So I've got both the import statement for Sendbird and Dash Chat available. So I'll just paste those both in here since we will be using both. Okay, so now, now that we have Dash Chat here, I am going to, oh, uh, sorry, just checking. Can you zoom in please? I'm able to see the screen. Ah, okay, so I'm assuming this is not big enough. All right, sorry, I didn't catch that earlier. Is this code now, now easier to read? Uh, if not, then uh, please post in the chat and I'll zoom in further. Okay, dash chat. So dash chat. Um, so the dash chat widget will render the entire chat experience. And that will take a minimum of two arguments or three arguments. One, the user. Uh, so the user object that denotes who the current logged in user is. An array of messages then an onsend handler. The onsend handler will return a dash chat message that you can then do something with. Uh, this is where we will later forward that call to sender to, to send out. OK, so if I do a hot reload on this, we will probably not see much of a change. The only thing you will probably see is down here at the very bottom is the send uh, text field and the send button. Okay, so that is kind of hard to see because we are rent using a simulator that doesn't have like a home button. So what I'm gonna, going to do is I'm going to wrap dash chat into a padding widget. And I'm just going to add padding down to the end because uh, that's the easiest thing to do. Edge insets, and we will do it left, top right. We'll just do the bottom. And once I do hot restart, we'll see this move up. And this is slightly easier to see. OK. All right. So now there are things we need to grab from Sendbird to populate this chat view. Uh, one is getting a Sendbird user and then converting it to a Dash Chat user, getting Sendbird messages, and then converting it to Dash Chat messages. OK. So to do this, we are going to call a number of things. We're just going to put this all into a single function. We'll just call it setup. Um, again, this isn't 
how you would probably want to set up a production app, but it very clearly kind of goes through the process. So first thing we'll do is we'll init Sember, and then we will connect to Sember. And when we do the connection, we will get a Sember user back. So that will give us part of the component that we need for Dash Chat. After that, we want to get a channel, a group channel. Uh, and I'll talk about group channels in a second. But we want to get a channel between the buyer and the seller. Right? Once we have the channel, then we can get the messages from that channel um, that may have preceded uh, the load of this view. Okay, and those messages again will have to be converted to dash chat messages so that it can uh, properly render everything. Okay, so to initialize Sendbird and to kind of skip ahead here, we are going to create three uh, static strings. One is going to be the app ID um, for your app in Sendbird, the other will be the user ID for the buyer, and the other will be the other user or the seller. So where do you get your app ID for your Sendbird application? You do that after you've registered and you've logged in, you'll get a screen that looks like this. And here, uh, if it's your first time, you will create a new application to test out. And here you can give it any name and you can select any number of these regions, uh, India uh, being probably the closest. And so here you can just select chat. You can change this at any point. So you can start with chat and calls and then switch back and forth. So it doesn't really matter what you choose here. Now I have a application all ready to go, uh, aptly named API Days India. Oop, I got kicked out for some reason. So let me log back in and go to API days. So when you go into your app, you can grab the app ID from up here. You can actually grab it in the previous screen as well, but I'd like to do it here for no particular reason. Okay, so once we copy this app ID, we can put that into our ultra simple app here. And here, just because I know I've created users previously, uh, I'm going to add myself as the buyer and my coworker Tanaka as the seller example. Okay, so back to setting up Sender. So what we will do is, uh, I guess we'll put everything into a try catch. Some basic error handling if something goes horribly wrong. Prevent the error if that should occur. Okay, so to get Sender, all we have to do is call the SDK and give it the app ID. Once we have the SDK initialized, we're gonna grab the user or get a user from a connect command. So this will fail if the app ID is invalid. Um, the user ID, not so much. So you could pass it a brand new user ID and our system in the backend will create a new uh, a new user for that ID. Um, so you don't do, you don't need to do a check and then or do a separate call to create a new user and then call connect. It's all done with the connect command. Okay, so if we have a user, then oh, so let's move this up top here. Sembird. Okay, once we've connected to Sembird, we want to grab uh, what channels are available. And what we should probably do is we're going to hold on to this channel. Now this channel is, uh, again, group channels, which uh, I did say I was going to talk about later, which I'll talk about now. So Sendbird offers two types of channels, group channels and open channels. Open channels are kind of like what you would see on YouTube, right? You have one person, one user that's broadcasting. And in the side chat window, you have this giant open room where people can kind of come in and just start chatting away. So that's what open channels are. It allows users who aren't logged in to kind of participate in a very large uh, event. And then group channels are used both for one-on-one -on -one chats and also group chats. So things you would see like on Twitter's messaging or WhatsApp, those are good examples. Okay, so here we're gonna use a group channel because that kind of fits with the idea of doing like a marketplace where you wanna to talk to the seller, but you probably don't wanna have that conversation um, you know, to a wider audience. You could, of course, set that up either way, uh, but we will just go with group channels. So here, we're going to get channels from Sembird. To do that, 
we are going to create a query object. Uh, go channel this query. So we're going to call this command, which will ping Sendbird looking for channels that this user is a part of. And we're going to want to put some uh, limits to this. So we would just want to grab the very first channel between these two users. So we're kind of simplifying things and assuming that there's only one. Um, the system, of course, totally supports multiple one-on-one -on -one channels with the same person. So you could have different um, sort of different instances. Uh, again, your particular use case would be different, but uh, we have a very flexible system that would allow that. Okay, and now we want to make sure that we're only including just that user, um, that seller. So here we'll pass in an array of other user IDs that we want to limit this search to. And here, um, I just need to put in the other user ID, which again, I had created up here. Okay, so once we have the, let's change this to our new property, our channel. Uh, oh, actually, you know what? We will keep that. So once this query object is available, we're just going to call the single command. Um, oops. Load, load next. Oh, what I was thinking. Okay, so load next. This command would allow you to, if there were multiple pages of, of results, you could continuously call this. But we only have one, so we don't need to do any sort of looping action. Okay, so this will return us an array of channels that match this criteria. Since it's only one, uh, the length will never be higher than one. But there's a chance that this will come back as an empty array because no previous channels exist. In that case we want to create a new channel. Okay. So here is if the length is zero, we'll create a new channel here later. Oh, and we need to change this to a synchronous operation. But if the if we do have a channel already, we'll just return that, right? So then we'll assign the channel property to channels first. This up here, so we keep track of this. Uh, this up here. And that makes it better. Okay, so we'll create this create channel function real quick. Actually, we'll just do it right here. So channel equal uh, group channel. And create channel. And it takes one argument, which is the group channels args. Group Channel uh, params, sorry. And the only thing we want to put into that is uh, the user IDs of the two folks that we want to connect. And I think I'm misremembering the group channel. Hold on, just double checking. Group channel. Group channel, group channel. Oh, right, because it's asynchronous. That's why I'm getting Sarah. And here we're assigning the user IDs to the two users. So this is one thing to take note of. So in doing a channel list query, you don't have to specify the current user's user ID. You just add in the user IDs of the other users you want to talk to. But when you create a channel, you do need to add in both the existing user and the other user. Uh, because the API does, would, does allow you to create channels for other users. So if you have some particular uh, special user type, um, you could enable that sort of connection capability. OK, so here we've got one way or the other. We've got a channel, either one that exists, or we created a brand new one between two users. Now that we have a channel, we can ping the channel and get the messages that we need from it. So here, I think. Uh, actually, we'll do this. We'll assign this to so we get the messages. We call the channel and just get messages. And we'll do it by timestamp. This is the default way of getting now. But we need it in seconds, epoch, which isn't the default option. We have milliseconds since epoch. And we'll just multiply that by 1,000 for seconds. 
and then we'll put in default params for our message list. So this parameter here would allow you to change the sorting order, access metadata or put in metadata, uh, gives you a number of options, but uh, we will just use the default here. Okay, so once we have that, have the messages, we'll just uh, go ahead and set the state of this class. So what we're going to do is we're going to assign messages to messages. messages. And of course, I don't think we have added that property yet. So we're going to add another property, a list of base messages. So Sendbird offers a number of different types of messages. All of them are extensions of the base message class. So this will allow us to hold all the different message types. And we could even set this up. Base message. Messages. Uh, messages. Another async. Okay. All right. So again, this setup process it initializes the Sendbird library, connects with Sendbird, verifies that it's running, and then we'll query Sendbird for all the channels that that user is a part of, looking for the first one that is with just one other user, the seller. And if that channel doesn't exist, we're gonna create that channel before pinging that channel for all the messages to then convert. Okay, so now we need to call that start function somewhere when we're first initializing this, this class. So what we're gonna do is we're going to add an init and a dispose. So this is a state, super, oops, super. And then whenever you do this, usually you want to add in a dispose because, and we definitely will because we'll be adding additional calls and listeners here. Dispose. Super dispose. Okay, since we're here, oh yes, so we're going to call this our start function here. Oh, set up. Okay. All right, so now if I rerun this, then we, it should kick off same burden and it should connect. So if it fails, we'll print off our statement, uh, but we won't actually visually see any changes here, but I'll go ahead and run a hot reload. And let's see, it looks like I might've hit an error. Call was on no. Okay, well, I'll continue on. Um, cause very like, cause I mean, this app is not completely missing for doing same connectivity status. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, I think this will resolve once I, I guess when I use this, once I finish up this app. Okay. So <clears throat> uh, while we're here with the init and dispose, what I'm going to do is I'm going to extend this, this state object with the Sendbird Mixin, uh, the group channel handler Mixin. Channel, no, channel event handler. Channel event handler. Okay, so what this mixin will do is it will allow your class to listen to um, updates when new messages are being sent by the users or users leave. You can uh, do a whole host of monitoring. So here you can kind of see uh, a list of some of the options that become available, like on message, delete, received, um, some metadata gets updated, and when users come and go. Okay, so. Uh, I'm, going to only, I'm going to only add when a message is received, because when we do get one, we're just going to add this to our messages property. Now, you notice here I'm using the set state command. I do it there, and I also do it in the setup. So for Flutter in this vanilla setup, in this state stateful widget, whenever you call set state and adjust any of the properties, then it will force the the primary build widget to rebuild itself. So this is how you can get the UI to update. Okay, so back up here, since I've added that mixin, I want to add in a event handler. Uh, I need to tie this to the Sendbird uh, SDK. So to do that, just do add channel event handler give it any unique identifier for this particular class. 
I'll just call it dash chat. And then the second argument is the class, which is this one. And we want to dispose of it here. So go to SDK. So check the time. Okay. Where? I mean, this, if you're going to remove it, then it just has to have the same name. Okay. All right. So when we first start up, we're going to call Sendbird. We will hopefully get the messages. This will hopefully work once we're finished completing this app. And then it will populate the messages property, which when this is set, will force dash chat to reload. Okay, so a uh, couple of things is we need to convert our Sendbird user to a chat user object, which is what dash chat uses. So we'll just call this function as dash chat user, and we will pass it a Sendbird user, which is just a user class. So we're going to return uh, chat user. And chat user takes three args, UID. And fortunately, the Sendbird version has a user ID property that matches up. Name, Sendbird's version of this is nickname. Now, nickname could be empty. So we'll just do an easy check here. If it's not null, we'll use the nickname. Otherwise, we'll just put an empty string. And the same for avatar URL. The Sendbird version is profile URL. That could also be empty. So it will do a URL or just blank. Now, there's also a chance, just in case, if um, a null user object is passed in um, to this function, you want to be able to, in this case, not really handle it super gracefully, but at least not crash the app. So if that's the case, then we will just return a blank user. And you may get a blank um, user from Sendbird if it's an admin message. They will not have, uh, the message sender will be not populated with a user. So that's one way of, of determining system messages from actual senders. Uh, okay, so if that's the case, then we will uh, we will just put in this name. We will just provide a blank chat user to dash chat. Now here, what we have user, we can just now add an chat user from Sendbird. And the SDK has a property once you've connected um, that's just called current user. So this is the Sendbird user type. Passing that in, we will then give dash chat user. All right, so next bit is the messages, which is going to be a very similar process. So we're going to feed it a list of chat messages and we will convert that from Sendbird um, base messages, which is what we're holding inside the um, underscore messages property. Oop. Base message, I keep adding an S to that. Okay, so fortunately Dart has uh, something very similar to uh, Python list comprehensions. So we're gonna return an array and within that array, we're going to loop through Loop through all the, I guess I'll call this Sendbird uh, SD message in messages. We'll loop through every message and then we're going to create and insert into this array a chat message or a new chat message object. Chat messages uh, for dash chat takes two properties, I believe user. Uh, so we'll need to convert user from the Sendbird message. Message. And that will be the sender property. And then the second property is the text that uh, that goes with the message. So here it will be the sender message. And it's just the message property. Okay, and that's it for converting messages. All right, so as dash chat messages. And we'll pass it in the messages property. So that should be it. So uh, if this works, we should see uh, just kind of a seed conversation. Uh, let's see how that goes. Call is called on now. Okay, so I have something unexpected, something I missed in the process. So what I'm going to do first is I'll quit this, I'll rerun this on the off chance that 
evaluation error while I check my code. Uh, so again, we are initializing Sembird. We are connecting, which, oh, this should be a basic call. I wonder if that's good. And here I'm not using <clears throat> the user object. Here you could check the user and store it, but since I know the Sembird SDK is retaining the user in the, the Sembird SDK uh, dot current user property, uh, I'm not doing anything with it here. Um, if this connection fails, it should trip this catch error, uh, this catch handler. And I'll try that. I can try that easily just by putting, putting in a bogus app ID, which should cause the connection to fail. Let's see, dispatcher. Okay, so this is an error that comes from dash chat, which I know exists, but I'm wondering why this came out empty. Okay, but anyways, uh, I'm going to try and trip this up first by, uh, I'll just get rid of this altogether. So this should give me a different kind of error. Yep. Uh, oh, okay. I was hoping it would handle more gracefully. Okay. Well, that is one way of doing it. Okay, so let me try running this again. And what did I forget to do? So we call setup, we connect. Dash chat then renders with the user ID and chat messages. Okay, so I guess what we could do here is Ah, so one way you could debug. Oh, okay. That was just a really long loading time. Okay, so here we can see the um, kind of the seeded chat message I had here. So I could, Antos, how are you liking <clears throat> API days? Yeah. Boom. Ah, and of course, this will not actually send anything because we haven't hooked up the final piece of this demo that I should be wrapping up soon it is the on send command from Dash Chat. So here, what we want to do is, I guess I'll do it right here, is we're going to send a message through Sendbird. And we have to do it by pulling the channel object that we retained. And we're going to send user message with text. And here we'll, we will take the dash chat message, which is an object, but not the actual payload. The payload is under the dot text property. Okay, so once that is sent, we now have a Sendbird version of that message. And what we're going to do is we're going to add that to our messages property. Okay, so now if I say, how are you liking API Days India? This will should now send and retains in dash chat. So just to double check this, what I'll do is I will just quickly swap users. I'll switch over to Monica and I should see these two bubbles reverse. And there we are. Okay, so this is on a real basic level how you can get a basic chat service up and running um, inside a Flutter app. There are many other features that we didn't even remotely touch on that Sendbird offers and also Dash Chat can help render, right? There's a lot of button triggers. You can monkey around with some of the avatars, the formatting, the text, a lot of styling things that you could do with Dash Chat um, that uh, Sendbird could easily uh, provide uh, feature sets for. Okay, so that wraps up the, the the coding portion of my of this workshop. Did anyone have any questions? Oh, I see Aravind and I'm terribly sorry, I'm mispronouncing everybody's name. Uh, requesting to come to the moderation chat panel. I'll go ahead and let you guys in so we can have uh, somewhat of a face to face conversation because that's always better. Okay, let's see here. Okay. So I know I did uh, go through this very quickly because I was trying to squeeze in quite a bit of coding in there. Um, 
did anyone have any questions? I didn't see any in the chat or the Q and A. Okay, um, since I don't see any chat and I don't know if hopping gives you the typing indicator, uh, which is a feature that Sember also does offer is the ability to, to, to get that feedback of when a uh, user is, is typing. I don't see that in Hopping. I don't remember if it's in there. So I'm going to assume there are no more questions. So I will post some links for everyone here. Um, the first link here is to a gist of the code that I just um, kind of quickly threw together. It's very similar to that. Uh, although I would invite you that if you're seriously considering um, um, implementing Sendbird with any sort of uh, UI, whether it's your own existing UI library or framework or another UI framework that you want to use, uh, I recommend checking out this tutorial. Uh, it goes a little more in depth to setting up the process and also shows you how you can set up a channel list so that uh, channel list so that um, you could kind of look at all the different channels that a user is a part of. So we kind of skipped through that and just immediately connected with a given user. But uh, there are many instances where you may want to give the user the ability to look at uh, what prior uh, lists are available. And uh, Gotham? Uh, oh, thank you. Okay, yes, too new to ask anything. Okay, well, you know, if there's anything even like uh, a basic Flutter question, um, I could possibly answer them for you. Um, you're very welcome for the tutorial. Um, okay. Oh, and the last, uh, I guess the last link that I'll post is to my LinkedIn. If you want to reach out, um, and have any additional questions uh, about Sendbird or Flutter or, um, or about the developer advocacy, we do have some open recs. So if you are, uh, excited of the prospect of doing basically what I'm doing here, like giving a workshop and talking about technology, uh, definitely reach out to me or check out our careers page. Okay, so I finished, uh, I think a few minutes early, which is surprising. Um, so if that's the case and no one has any additional questions, uh, I guess we'll go ahead and let everybody go. Um, oh, before I do that, I do see my coworkers in the chat room. Um, Angeline, if you are actually there, is there anything else that, uh, that I should talk about that I might have forgot? Is there, uh, I, we do have an event next week talking about more Flutter um, at Code Cafe. And of course, don't have that link handy with me, but I can pull that. Yes, Code Cafe, yes. And now, that's the one link I did not prepare ahead of time. Let me see if I can pull that up real quick. Cafe. I always must remember that uh, link, so I will have to. Moment while I hunt it down. <clears throat> Oop. Ah, events, that's why. Okay. Okay, so here's a link to uh, our Code Cafe events coming up. And the one next week is actually kind of fun. So it's not on, uh, not like this type of workshop where we go through building a full application. It's kind of a showcase of a really fascinating app that um, one of our friends and partners have, have done. So they've taken a Flutter app with Unity and a wearable IoT device and put it all together into uh, basically a, a mini game that you control with this device you're wearing ahead. So uh, it's, it's really exciting. I'm really looking forward to that, that, that demo. And if you would like to check that out, definitely check out our Code Cafe link. Okay, if that's it, then I will let everyone go and have a great rest of your day and enjoy the rest of the conference.